All right, so starting out with the general principles in our search for life. We um, use this definition for life that it's something that eats, grows, reproduces, and evolves. So those four criteria helped us devise some conditions for habitability, right? So we talked about energy sources, such as sunlight or tidal heating, um, liquid water, an atmosphere, which is useful for various reasons, and a magnetic field. Um, and those four um, conditions of habitability are things that we can look around our solar system and say, do those places have these conditions? So um, when we go then and search for life directly on other worlds, there's a couple ways we can go about it. We can search directly for signs that life exists, right? So once we identify our habitable worlds, we'll go there and we'll look for molecules, organic molecules that could be created only from biological activity. These are called biogenic molecules. Um, but this is not the only way that we can look for life. We could also look for other biomarkers, right? You came up with some of these in the activity last time. Um, most of you identified that oxygen or other byproducts of metabolism would be helpful to look for. Um, you could also look for radio transmissions from technological societies, or you could even look for colors that signal that biology is happening on the surface of a planet. So for example, uh, the color green is not very common in terms of uh, rocks when you look around the solar system. Uh, so maybe the color green could be a tip that there's some sort of photosynthesis happening. So um, what have we actually done in terms of searching for life in the solar system? The first place your mind probably takes you is Mars. So let me ask you, um, in addition to an energy source, which is of course sunlight, which habitability criteria does Mars currently have? All right. So some of you have taken 121 and therefore would sort of know about this. Um, so Mars currently has an atmosphere. Technically it has a magnetic field, but the magnetic field is not very strong. It's not anywhere near as strong as Earth's. So I guess technically you could be right with D, but Mars does have an atmosphere. On the other hand, Mars's atmosphere is really thin and it doesn't contain ozone. So it's not really that protective from UV radiation and it doesn't do that much to help keep the temperature of Mars steady. It keeps the Mars steadier than the moon or Mercury, which don't have any atmosphere at all. So it has an atmosphere and that can be at least somewhat protective of life, but it doesn't have a magnetic field that's strong enough to shield from solar wind. Um, and currently it does not have liquid water widespread on its surface. There is lots of evidence that it had liquid water on the surface in the past though. So um, here's the um, info on Mars's atmosphere again. It does have a fairly broad swing of daytime and nighttime temperatures, which would not be the most hospitable environment you could imagine, um, but at least it's not so bad as the moon or especially Mercury. All right, so because Mars does have these criteria, it does have an atmosphere, it used to have liquid water. Um, there's been a lot of exploration of Mars. So here's a few NASA missions that you should know about. Um, the first was Viking, so 1976. Viking was a rover on the surface that searched for organic molecules and also looked for evidence of biological activity and the results of Viking were inconclusive. Um, there's some evidence to support that Viking did find organic or could have found organic molecules, but the way that it heated samples up, the soil samples that it took would have accidentally burned all of the material that it found um, because of some of the other ingredients that are present in Mars soil. So that is too bad. <laughs> um, but Spirit and Opportunity in 2004, they were extremely instrumental in providing solid evidence for a past history of liquid water on Mars. And that has actually paved the way for the more recent missions to Mars. Um, the, the locations that we're choosing to send rovers to now are to continue to investigate the history of liquid water. And then Curiosity in 2012 found a, um, well, drilled into mudstone and the mudstone contained organic materials. So you can read more about all these missions here. We'll explore missions a little bit more in our activity today. So plenty of things that NASA has been doing at least um, to explore Mars, lots of searches for evidence of life, but so far no evidence of actual life has been found. 
you might wonder, wait, Curiosity found organic materials. Well, not all organic materials are biogenic. There are some organic materials that can come about simply through physical or chemical means. And so if you uh, find organic materials and you want to pin it on life, you have really have to rule out the other options first. So there's no current evidence that there is any biogenic um, organics on Mars. Okay, last time we also talked about the um, outer moons of our solar system and that many of them have liquid oceans underneath their icy crust. And so my question for you is what energy source do they have that living things could take advantage of? All right, I see the most votes for B and E. So yes, that's what I had in mind as well. Um, there's not really that much sunlight in the far reaches of the solar system, but, and especially if you're thinking about the oceans underneath the icy crust, um, the sunlight would not be able to penetrate the thick ice. So that means that there has to be some other source of energy. Last time we talked about tidal heating as a source, um, but there's also evidence that there could be chemical energy available. And so um, as your textbook describes it, chemical energy is something that living things can take advantage of if there are reducing and oxidizing chemistries in a given location. Um, so reducing and oxidizing just means that there is some sort of um, ionic exchanges. So exchanges of charged particles, um, basically an oxidizing environment is like one where things can rest, right? And a reducing environment, uh, I'm gonna get the chemistry wrong, so don't hold me to it, is one where um, electrons, no, I don't have it. If you want the chemistry, you're gonna have to talk to the chemist. But one of them, electrons come out, the other one, electrons go in to a given substance. So it basically acts like an, a little battery. And because there's a chemical gradient that is moving energy from place to place, then life can tap into that. And this happens in the hydrothermal vents of Earth's deep oceans. So that is suggestive that perhaps a deep liquid ocean that's tidally heated and can support chemical energy, um, maybe that could support life. So there's lots of interest in sending probes to the outer worlds, um, but they're very far away. So that makes it a little bit hard to do exploration. Um, but here are some missions that we have done. So the Galileo probe arrived at Jupiter in 1995 and um, provided evidence that Europa has this, a saltwater ocean under its ice. Um, the Hubble telescope, surprisingly enough, was responsible for discovering that Ganymede, um, which is one of Jupiter's moons, has a saltwater ocean under its ice as well. And then there's the Cassini probe, which arrived at Saturn in 2005 um, that found the hydrocarbon lakes and subsurface water on Titan, and also the plumes of salt water spewing out of vents on the moon Enceladus. So all these moons are super interesting places to look for life. Um, and there are missions being planned there, which you will explore in your activity.